So uh, this talk, I think, is a, is a nice follow-on to, to one you had here maybe 18 months ago with Brian Arbogast, who's the head of the Gates Foundation Water and Sanitation Program. And uh, if you've seen his, his remarks, um, you know, he queued up a number of these technologies. And I guess what I would like to sort of take further is where have we come uh, over the last couple of years uh, with this work um, and where we are now uh, with some of their de de test deployments. So I want to uh, focus on urban sanitation uh, in my presentation today. Um, I'm going to start with uh, some sort of high level setting the stage uh, for the challenge uh, that we have uh, in urban sanitation. Some of this uh, may be very familiar to, to you, um, but I think it's a good context for getting into the discussion about it's time maybe to rethink and reinvent uh, the way that we manage human excreta. Um, so I'll, I'll go from that introduction into uh, an overview of three of the technologies that are in the portfolio. Um, and these are interesting, I think, because they are uh, ones that have advanced from the lab into the field. Uh, they're all actively now being deployed and tested on various locations. Uh, and the three also represent different use cases, uh, ones at a household scale, uh, ones at a shared or public toilet setting, and the other is a community scale uh, fecal sludge treatment system. Um, and then I'll wrap up the, the last part of my talk. I want to touch on the issues around policy, um, standards uh, of performance uh, for these new technologies, um, and also some insights that we have in terms of user perspectives and behavior change around the use uh, and experience with these technologies. So first, the sanitation challenge. Um, many of you probably know the statistic of 4.5 billion people globally uh, do not have access to safe sanitation. Um, and a large percentage uh, are open defecating on a regular basis, and a large percentage of those are found in India. And this has real public health impacts uh, in uh, very stark statistic around child deaths related to diarrheal disease, uh, nearly 800,000 per year of children under five dying from diarrhea. And I would argue that urban sanitation is particularly neglected. Um, there's been a lot of investment uh, in rural sanitation over the 15, last 15 years. There's probably been less focus on urban sanitation, um, uh, particularly where it's needed the most. There have been perhaps investments uh, in uh, business districts or higher income portions of a city, um, but those portions of, it, of cities that are underserved, there have not been great investments uh, in advancing that. And in the urban context, uh, I think that has grave consequences. Um, the, the crowded, the proximity to waste um, has health and environmental um, and economic impacts uh, on those that live in the communities uh, and live and work in those cities. And while containment um, is a big problem, uh, probably treatment may be even a bigger problem um, in that in most global south cities, uh, we do not have uh, safe treatment. Um, it varies obviously between city, but uh, statistics are 70 to 90 percent of the waste in many developing countries uh, does not go, uh, is perhaps collected, uh, but it does not get treated. And lastly, we see this, this urban environment, and, and you're certainly at the forefront of writing about and speaking about this in, in your own um, urban uh, sustainability research. Uh, but these urban areas are growing. Um, the areas that are underserved are growing. Uh, the geography of those areas uh, is ever enlarging. Um, so it's a big challenge in terms of to provide safe sanitation uh, in the urban context. And this gap remains, right? Um, if you look back at the Millennium Development Goals, which ended in 2015, sanitation was the, one of the metrics that was underperforming, one of the worst performing metrics, right? Um, and we're not off to a great start with the SDGs uh, in terms of the gap um, of sanitation coverage. Um, while a lot of progress has been made in containment and in some cases in treatment, uh, these urban areas continue to grow, uh, so in many cases we're not even keeping up. We're not even keeping pace uh, with, with the changes that are happening in these urban contexts. 
An important uh, sort of addition to these uh, global metrics with the SGGs is that we've now gone to include treatment uh, as part of the metric. Uh, so that's, uh, I think, a, a real significant step uh, in terms of recognizing the value not only of containment, but also recognizing that treatment uh, is one of our global goals uh, as part of SDG 6. So in this context, what does safely managed mean? Um, so in short, it really is uh, a population that's using an improved facility, uh, and importantly, using a facility that protects them from coming into human contact with that waste stream. Um, and that it can be safely disposed, uh, and that it could be treated either on-site uh, or off-site. And there are a number of sort of infrastructure mechanisms to achieve uh, improved sanitation. Uh, these could be a poor flush or automated flush that goes into a sewer, uh, septic tanks uh, or pit latrines, um, ventilated pit latrines, even composting toilets or, or, or uh, pit latrines that have a slab uh, for uh, their user interface mechanism. So that's the way uh, uh, safe sanitation is being defined uh, within the context of SGGs. And what we know is there's a lot of not very safe sanitation, uh, not safely managed going on. Here are a few examples. Um, on the top left you see a, a community uh, scale toilet uh, in a urban slum area that's gone into disrepair, uh, which leads directly into open defecation um, immediately on that site. The top right, um, emblematic of uh, what happens in many areas where containment is not great, um, or there is some containment and transport, uh, but that uh, waste is simply taken to the nearest drainage ditch uh, and emptied uh, into uh, the ditch or the water body that's nearby. On the left bottom, you see many examples of inappropriate infrastructure, a user interface that's neither safe uh, um, nor sanitary for the users or the community they, that's immediately around it. And lastly, uh, on the far right bottom, where you have containment, you still have uh, many needs for manual uh, removal, manual management uh, of that waste. So if you look at water, um, I think it's, you sort of can't talk about sanitation without thinking about water. Um, and I think it's important in the context of thinking about reinvention of, of toilet technologies as well. Um, but as I'm sure you know, similar statistics related to water scarcity in the world, and it's, it's right upon us. Um, certainly the news of the last year in Cape Town um, dramatically uh, demonstrates that fact, uh, that in many parts of the global south, uh, we're facing water scarcity. And that has real implications for industry, for agriculture, um, and for household sanitation. And if you overlay that um, graphic uh, with where we have deficits in sanitation coverage, um, it really draws your attention to uh, South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, where you have both a very large uh, underserved population uh, for sanitation um, and you're approaching water scarcity, um, which is going to put huge challenges on drinking water tables um, and large challenges on typical approaches uh, to wastewater treatment. So this brings us to the topic of rethinking um, where we are with uh, sanitation solutions. Um, so we had a, a number of very important inventions um, 1596, uh, John Harrington is credited with uh, developing the flush toilet. Um, in 1775, Alexander Cummings um, developed a, a, the S-trap toilet, which was a very important improvement in keeping water in the bowl uh, and keeping odors uh, from coming back up from the sewer lines. Um, and then Thomas Crapper um, made a, a number of important um, plumbing innovations uh, around the WC or the water closet um, and how um, the flush mechanism worked and was linked to, to sewers. 
But you can see from this timeline, uh, much of this innovation happened many years ago. Um, and we continue to rely on these, these fundamental technologies um, as our mechanism for getting to flush and forget. Which cues up the sort of norms that we are in now of, uh, in the developed world and in, in many richer parts of uh, developing countries, um, traditional sewered infrastructure. Um, these are large um, and they're not very sustainable, I would argue. Um, it's probably not a very smart sanitation solution. Uh, we pump water into a water treatment plant. We treat it to drinking water quality. We bring it into our homes. Um, and then we flush our toilets with drinking water quality um, using five to nine liters per flush. We convey that with water. It goes into a wastewater treatment plant. Uh, huge capital cost for that plant. Lots of water, lots of energy consumed to take the water out of that, dry uh, the solids, and, and create a treatment process. And then we use water as conveyance to take it back into typically a watershed where we then repeat the whole cycle again. Uh, we can probably do better in terms of thinking about how we manage our water, how we manage our energy and, and capital expenditures toward wastewater treatment. As you look at the Global South, um, sewer sanitation is probably not a route that many will achieve. Um, there's not enough time, probably not enough money, land or resources uh, to get us there. Uh, Technically, it can be very challenging. The costs are extremely high. Uh, the operation and maintenance burden um, is very taxing uh, in many of these settings. Access to land, uh, topography, particularly in uh, the large numbers of mega cities that are coastal cities, uh, is a real challenge. Right? Um, and even where you have pipe sewage, there are limits to its reach. Um, so many. Uh, sewered areas of the, in the developing world are in higher income areas or in the central business district, uh, but that sewer line uh, often does not reach uh, into the underserved. The middle class and the lower income communities may not be served uh, by that pipe sewage network. There's also many examples where you've had investments, uh, um, city I've been working with uh, in Ahmedabad in India over the last few years, major investments in, in the sewer network uh, that bring it um, within proximity uh, to low-income communities, but it's up to the household to develop the link um, and pay for that link uh, to the pipe sewer. And of course, these are lower income areas, um, and that's out of their uh, financial means to actually close that last set of meters to the pipe. And then you have the issue of informal settlements uh, that are being underserved, um, and you have land, land rights in question. Um, these are informal settlements. Uh, many people are there as squatters that have gone on and on, perhaps, and living there for 15 to 20 years. But neither the city, local government, uh, or the household has a large appetite for making significant infrastructure investments when tenancy and rights um, are certainly in question. So with that, that's sort of a backdrop uh, for the Reinvent the Toilet uh, program uh, that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation launched in, in 2011. And they subsequently launched uh, initiatives in India in 2014 and in China in 2015, creating uh, additional challenges uh, for country researchers in India and China to also go on to thinking about ways for reinventing the toilet. And the key criteria for the global research community was to think about ways of, of re-examining the way we manage human excreta um, and to try to do this off the grid, uh, do it in a way that does not require power, uh, does not require a, a outside water source, or does not re rely on a connection to a sewer. A second criteria related around a, a waste treatment system that can kill all the pathogens on site. Uh, so it gets away from that that big risk of handling and transport um, where diseases uh, can, can grow and be spread. The third is, is certainly a financial metric of try to do this on five cents per person per day. Um, and lastly, that 
while this is certainly geared toward the developing world, um, it is to be aspirational, um, new and exciting products and appliances, uh, but that may have application uh, both in developed and developing countries. So a number of researchers around the world have, have gone through a series of grants with this. Um, some have advanced, some have dropped out, um, and I'm going to share with you now uh, a few examples of those that have advanced. So the first example um, is a household toilet innovation uh, from Cranfield University in the UK. Um, and I do have their permission to speak to this uh, today. Uh, I don't work directly with this technology, but we do a lot of work with Cranfield as a partner on some of the subsystems uh, re related to the, the waste treatment um, value chain. The second example uh, is a block toilet or public or shared toilet uh, setting designed for an uh, institutional setting. Um, and this is led by Duke University. And the third example uh, is a community scale treatment system uh, focused on uh, fecal sludge treatment uh, led by biomass controls. So each of these are innovations that have progressed uh, over the last five years uh, from lab uh, to uh, actual testing now in various countries, particularly India and South Africa. So I'll start with a Cranfield unit. Um, if you've been to Seattle and the Bill and Melinda Gates Visitor Center, um, you'll now see uh, this Cranfield uh, prototype toilet on display. You can see the toilet um, is very compact um, and there's a lot going on, um, but you basically have a waste treatment unit uh, underneath uh, and behind the toilet seat. So the basics of how this system is designed to work, um, it's a waterless toilet, so someone uses the toilet um, and then there is a, a wiper system that directs the liquid in one direction and the solids in another direction uh, and they go into separate containers for treatment. So on the left side um, you have the, an Archimedes screw that takes the solids um, and, and pulls that up um, into a drying process. Um, so there's a, a small lighter um, that would be activated um, and then the fuel would be the feces that has been dried and pelletized. Um, and so, so that's the fuel to drive the combustion. Um, and the system's designed to generate energy uh, from that combustion that would help drive the mechanics uh, of this treatment process. And then on the right hand side uh, you have the, the liquid processing system. Um, so you have the liquid uh, going through a warming step um, and then it goes into uh, passing through a series of membranes um, and then it, it develops into a, a water vapor and that vapor then drops down into a, a containment reservoir for that water could, could then be used outside of the toilet, either disposed of or, or reused um, in various settings. So they, this is a prototype. Um, it's now advanced to some limited field testing in Durban, South Africa. Uh, here's, so here's an example of earlier this year when we were there. Um, and their system is being tested uh, at a number of homes that have uh, urine diversion toilets um, that have been installed by the municipality. And now they're trialing um, this uh, Cranfield user interface. And there's a lot of research going on in terms of how people perceive this idea of, of, of the waste uh, being managed in a, in a waterless function. So that's at the household scale. The next example uh, is one I've worked a lot with uh, over the last few years, um, led by Duke University. Um, so there are a lot of similarities in the technology approach. So in this case, uh, as someone uses the toilet, the waste is then separated uh, through a belt system. So the solids go to the left uh, and the liquids go to the right. Uh, the liquids go into a three tank system, a baffle tank um, and settling tank. Uh, it goes through electrochemical disinfection um, and then is treated and goes into a storage tank. And then that water is available for reuse uh, as flush water or potentially for other purposes uh, within the system. 
And on the left, uh, the solids are being processed at the same time in a batch mode. Uh, so the solids are being uh, squeezed and dried um, and uh, using the heat that's generated from the feces fuel. Um, and then the, the feces drops onto a plate dryer uh, where it is further dried and then it chips off into a small pelletized fuel uh, that is then available for combustion. Um, and energy can be generated uh, from this combustion process. So this particular system is scaled for a public or shared toilet application. So think of a public market, a factory, a school, um, as ideal settings uh, where this might be deployed. It, it relies on the solids uh, for source of energy, therefore the scale uh, is not yet uh, maximized or uh, feasible uh, at a household level. So this particular system has been tried uh, in several different settings. Um, this one was in Ahmedabad at SEPT University, a distinguished uh, urban planning school. Um, and here was a sort of a, a new model, new constructed toilet uh, where the processing unit is built underneath the toilet seat. And it's about an eight foot by 10 foot footprint. Um, and in this particular demonstration unit, there was one toilet seat on the inside of the cabin, a hand wash station on the inside, and then there's two urinals uh, on the outside. And all that waste uh, would be treated uh, as it goes and drops into the, the processing that's underneath. There's some images here of, of, the, of the liquid system uh, and then the dried uh, pellet. Another example uh, that was installed earlier this year is in South India in the town of Kompator. Um, this one is a, a different use case uh, at a private sector textile mill where uh, men and women workers um, are in resident. This particular system is set up at the women's dormitory um, where there are nine toilets, um, showers, and wash basins and closed uh, washing basins. Uh, and the waste is being treated uh, in a system that's been retrofitted um, underneath the toilet block. But all the processing happens, again, under that basically eight foot by 10 foot footprint uh, that's adjacent and underneath the, the toilet block. And this is very interesting because of its access in thinking about gray water treatment, um, which is something that the technology is working to advance into. Uh, but it also is working with uh, a community of migrant contract workers that come from northern India, typically Orissa, Bihar in this particular location, and they come and work at the factory for a couple of years. Um, and so typically they are very low income, um, and so this is potentially a, a better solution um, that for their own factory site, but it may, we hope, uh, influence um, their behavior and practice uh, as they return home. The third example of this technology is just being uh, deployed this week uh, in Durban, South Africa. Um, this is a partnership with uh, the University, University of KwaZulu-Natal and Etiquini uh, Water Utility. Uh, both are very well renowned for their uh, interest in innovation in, in water and sanitation and their willingness to try um, uh, various new approaches. Uh, so this particular use case uh, is in a community evolution block. Uh, so it's set up um, where the city has developed this approach for informal settlements that do not have sanitation solutions. Um, they can't afford or there's not enough time to provide household level. So they've developed this mechanism for bringing in toilets that are in a container, um, typically three to four seats. Um, it also includes showers, um, sink for hand washing, and a sink for clothes washing. Uh, so these are units, a male uh, cab and a fe um, female cab would be set up uh, typically serving a population maybe of uh, 300 to 500 people. So in this case we're coming in uh, with a retrofit, it's an existing cab, an existing slum community. Um, our particular treatment system comes in in a um, additional shipping container and that's being brought uh, directly behind um, the women's uh, cab. Uh, where that waste will be in, uh, treated. And again, this is an opportunity to treat not only the black water, uh, but to also uh, advance into uh, treating the gray water uh, from these systems as well. And 
In each of these test cases, um, there is a platform uh, that's being supported uh, by the Gates Foundation to help us do the testing and demonstration in country. Um, so in India, there's a, a platform of, of research and laboratory support. Uh, likewise, in Durban, um, there's a network of, of logistical support and laboratory support to ensure things are working uh, and to help us troubleshoot them when they're not. Um, and these are some of the basic metrics um, that we're working against um, as we do this uh, testing and demonstration. The last application of this Duke uh, reinvent the toilet technology uh, is a, a collaboration with the U.S. Army uh, Research and Development uh, in, at a Natick uh, in Boston. Um, so this is exciting in a number of ways. Uh, one, it's a potential new customer uh, for the reinvent the toilet technology, um, but it also takes the technology to a mobile setting. Um, so the system has been put uh, onto a trailer. Um, so the entire treatment unit is shown there on the left, and you've got a, a toilet, and you could have multiple toilet seats um, in this particular application. And the Army is looking for, obviously, a better treatment solution, uh, particularly in forward operating bases where they maybe have 70 to 100 uh, troops uh, out in a low resource setting. Their typical sanitation uh, solution is a, uh, a, a toilet that goes, drops down into uh, an, or an oil drum, and then they light the oil drum on fire, uh, and, and then that's the treatment solution. Uh, so we can do better than that, and so that was one of the, the areas for research and development. Uh, but also a key driver for them is the supply chain. Uh, so one of their biggest security risks uh, is the movement of uh, petrol and oil uh, and water. Um, so if you can do on-site treatment, um, you're reducing the supply chain requirements and therefore lowering the risks um, for those providers uh, that are working that supply chain. So this is a, a very interesting research, but we also see it has a number of commercial applications. Um, so these mobile systems are something that is quite common um, in a number of settings. This example comes from Ahmedabad, uh, where you see mobile toilets provided by the municipality. Um, these might be provided for a special event, but more often than not, they're being used to brought into informal settlements. Um, and unfortunately, politically driven over the last year, they're seeing increased use uh, as a way to check the box that they're no longer open defecating, that they're open defecating free, so these cities can now claim that they're uh, in line with the big uh, sanitation swash Bharat movement in India. So these are being deployed as a mechanism to serve the informal settlements. But often they don't stay. Um, they're there for a while and then they're gone. Right. Um, so this is basically a, a toilet uh, with a containment chamber underneath. Um, and then they take the trailer uh, and dump it, um, sometimes at the waste treatment plant, sometimes in the, in the field, wherever they, they choose. But you can imagine the mobile application that we were developing with the Army having Again, applications in this setting, but you can also see it being used for pilgrimage or religious ceremony sites where you have a big gathering of people that have no sanitation solution. Um, commercial construction sites is another application where you typically you'll have 100 to 300 workers and their families in resident for 18 months, and they may have a pit latrine or they may have nothing um, at these work sites. So you could bring in um, a, a toilet solution that's mobile um, and one that could actually treat the waste on site. The last example of the technologies uh, is one from Biomass Controls, uh, what is being called a fecal sludge treatment unit. Um, so this is a picture from uh, a town in Telangana um, called Warangal in India. Um, so it's set up as a, a series of uh, containers um, to manage uh, fecal sludge. And these have been established um, in several cities um, by the municipality, um, typically on the outskirts of the town um, as a sanitation park. Uh, it's an area where the trucks are being, being brought in um, and the treatment happens uh, through these containerized steps. So the heart of this technology is a biogenic refinery, so a, a pyrolysis unit for thermal treatment. 
um, of the sludge. Um, so the sludge is being brought in trucks. Uh, these, these systems are typically seeing three to four trucks per day, um, and they're processing that, way, that waste stream in about an eight-hour time frame. Um, so it's, it's being um, screened and degritted, detrashed. It goes into a drying process, um, and it's using the heat from the combustion to achieve that uh, drying process. Um, and then there's a, a biochar um, byproduct that's being produced, uh, which is uh, ideal for uh, agricultural supplement as a soil, soil amendment. There's also some reach arch being done by several groups uh, looking at uh, filtration or odor control strategies, also using this uh, biochar byproduct. And the great thing about these systems is that they're small, um, they're containerized so they can be uh, set up and broken down fairly quickly um, and fairly cost effectively. Um, and they can manage uh, a number of different uh, characteristics of waste. So it can be uh, pit uh, sludge or it can be uh, septic tank waste. So there are several of these examples uh, that are now being deployed. Uh, the original one started in Bangalore uh, four years ago. Um, this was the test facility. Uh, and now there are three others that have been set up in the last year. Uh, again, in partnership uh, with Thai Technocrats, the local operating partner, um, and a municipality that has provided the land uh, for these spaces. Uh, uh, so one's in Maharashtra, uh, one's in Telangana, and one's in uh, Andhra Pradesh. And each of these cities are sizable, um, close to a million in population. Uh, they have no um, pipe sewage, uh, so it's all septic tanks and pit latrines or open defecation that's occurring. And these systems are running, uh, by and large, by private sector uh, uh, vacuum truck operators. So the, the city it does not have any financial role uh, in the collection. Uh, the individual households pay for collection, um, and then the truck operators uh, bring that waste uh, to the treatment plant. Uh, there's still work to be done in terms of consistency and being sure that those trucks reach the uh, treatment plant and that's one of the, the roles of the city uh, is to be the, the bad cop uh, and celebrating the ones that do a good job um, and then uh, bringing enforcement on those that don't do a good job. Another example of this biomass uh, uh, refinery technology is an application that's been set up uh, in Alaska um, in the town of Kevalina. This is in uh, Northwest Arctic Borough. Uh, in northwest Alaska, a very small community of uh, just over 400 people, um, tribal population, um, and so poor sanitation is not just a problem uh, in the developing world. And it's, it's estimated that over 600,000 um, Native Americans and tribal people do not have access to safe sanitation either. Uh, so this is one particular approach to, to look at that problem. Um, and it's a very challenging one, uh, but also a very interesting one in, in its climate conditions and the demands that that places. Um, so currently the community is using a urine diversion toilet, um, and basically the, the solid waste goes into a bucket, um, a honey bucket, uh, and that is simply dumped into their landfill where also solid waste has been going. Because of the cold climate, they don't use a lot of water. They use a lot of wet wipes uh, for cleaning. Um, uh, so one of the innovations with this particular application uh, is the inclusion of a, a major shredder um, at the front end of the treatment process that's able to manage menstrual absorbance as well as these wet wipes um, in vast quantities. Um, and then those, along with the fecal sludge, uh, goes into the pyrolysis system. And all of these systems um, are smart technologies uh, in that they're able to be managed uh, with an app, a Kelvin app, uh, that has been developed by Biomass Controls. Um, it allows for remote monitoring uh, in operations um, and also helps us uh, have a number of key performance indicators in terms of uh, key uh, processing functions. So we're able to monitor in real time uh, what has happened at the India site and the Alaska site um, using this app. Uh, 
So let me uh, move to the final section of the talk uh, in terms of thinking about some of the policies and, and regulatory issues, and then also issues of uh, user adoption with some of these technologies. Um, while these technologies are great, you know, a lot at the end of the day will come back to governance uh, and to policy. Um, and there are things that need to be done to help uh, make these technologies viable uh, in the marketplace. So one, I think, is, is policies to catch up uh, with these technologies, one in their size, in their, their small scale decentralized systems. A lot of the um, guidelines for pollution control are not sized uh, for these units. Uh, there aren't good policy guidance on water reuse um, or biochar applications. Um, so in that context, there could be real incentives uh, and real boost uh, achieved through policy change that recognizes the, the benefits of these new technologies. Uh, second is procurement technical guidelines. Um, you know, it's very challenging to get new technologies onto the approved list. Uh, typically, maybe the, the national level urban ministry has uh, a checklist of those technologies that are approved for state and local government to procure. So these technologies have to uh, make it on that list uh, through proving that they're viable uh, options uh, from a technical and uh, cost per performance standpoint. Another uh, question is around uh, state and local government uh, sort of business models. Um, so with these new technologies, you're forcing some rethinking of, of what are the roles and responsibilities uh, of the state and the local government and perhaps a, a private operator. Um, you could have a lease model uh, where a private company comes in and takes over the school toilets and manages those. But that's a, f a fundamental change in the Department of Education or the local government's role in providing school sanitation. Right? And similarly, um, if you think about the role of the private sector in uh, vacuum truck management or the management of a fecal sludge drying plant, um, these are all steps uh, that need new business models as these new technologies become available. And a really big issue, I think, is around enforcement um, and standards for uh, pollution control and emissions uh, and discharge. And you can have a treatment plant be built, but unless you have compliance with these vacuum truck operators, for example, it doesn't make any difference. Right? So getting the local governments to enforce uh, and encourage the use of these new treatment plants uh, is a key driver to the, the value proposition of these decentralized systems. And a final topic is around workforce development. Um, new opportunities, sort of a new sanitation economy uh, can be in, imagined. And there's a lot of good work on this being done by the Toilet Board Coalition, which is a global group uh, with major multinational corporations um, like Unilever and Furmanich and Kimberly Clark uh, participating uh, to help drive change uh, with this in the sector. And a core part of it is, is certainly de developing new operators, better engineering, uh, to support these systems, but also professionalizing the fecal sludge business uh, and ensuring uh, health and safety standards um, are intact. The next topic is around standards. Um, there's a lot of uh, emphasis being placed by the Gates Foundation to support um, global convenings and working groups around developing standards for these two technologies. Uh, so there's two core groups that are driving toward uh, ISO standard certification. So one is called uh, Project Committee 318, which is focused on the processing uh, fecal sludge units. And the second uh, is 305, which is focused on the household uh, and shared and public toilet setting scale uh, with these new technologies. Uh, so there's a whole series of working groups that meet um, almost every quarter. Uh, and increasingly, the countries are participating of now grown, uh, I was just last week in Senegal at a PC318 meeting. Uh, there we had about 35 countries uh, from Af Africa and Asia participating in the development uh, of these new standards. And their standards are important uh, in that they are set some benchmarks um, and it will help the innovators uh, get into the marketplace uh, if they're able to say that they've passed a standard and these standards are clear in terms of the, the health and safety uh, performance expectations that they set out. 
It also creates the mechanism to get into procurement mechanisms um, and, and again to, to get broader into the market uh, for these technologies. And then my last two slides are I want to touch on uh, user adoption um, and some of the work we've done around the Duke uh, reinvent the toilet uh, application. Uh, this is a probably another talk uh, in, all in and of itself. Um, so we have a lot of data from a lot of um, survey research, household level surveys, focus groups, and individual interviews um, around these new technology approaches. So one of the things we're trying to understand is what do people think um, of being in close proximity to the waste and having it treated on site? And then what do people react to these particular approaches? So uh, liquid treatment using electrochemical disinfection, uh, drying and combustion of the solids. Are people comfortable being around and having that happen uh, where they use the toilet? Right. And then also thinking about reuse and recovery strategies and what, again, what might be culturally appropriate or permissible um, uh, with that. So some high-level high findings. Um, around the liquid, we see very positive views. Um, a lot of excitement around the idea of, of water conservation uh, and the opportunity to, uh, to reuse. Um, and this, a lot of this work was done in Gujarat, which is one of those water-stressed areas, very hot, very dry. Um, so the idea of, of saving water is something that people are, are very, very aware of. We also see uh, very positive views on reuse, uh, particularly for flush water, um, where there's no risk of, of really of, of contact to that water. We ask a lot of questions around solid waste and combustion. Um, in, in the India context, um, there is a lot of familiarity with the idea of uh, ge generating energy from feces uh, because it's often used, uh, cow dung is used uh, for uh, cooking. Um, so this idea of the ability to generate energy uh, from human excreta uh, is not a foreign one, uh, and people were very comfortable with that. Um, and there's a bit of a wow factor uh, with the idea that actually my poop can be turned into energy. And lastly, uh, we did some work around menstrual absorbance, um, and our system designed in um, a discrete mechanism for disposal of used absorbance on site, uh, which is a big problem area uh, in many shared and public settings. And we also explored the idea of on site incineration uh, with these used uh, absorbance. Uh, and again, we find a great deal of support for the privacy and discretion um, that safely managed on site uh, disposal brings, but also general support for incineration. And the last uh, slide is on user adoption um, around water reuse. And this is a bigger topic, and we sliced it up in several different ways. Uh, so, looking at flush water application, uh, anal cleansing application, hand washing application and general purpose applications. So as I, as I mentioned on the previous slide, very high acceptance, near universal, for reusing the water uh, for flush. Uh, acceptance declines uh, as you go down to the next level in terms of using this uh, recycled water, even though it's safe, uh, for, uh, for anal cleansing. Uh, we see it more often accepted among men, less so among women. Um, and some uh, religious variation between Hindu and Muslim. Hand washing, um, water purity for, is certainly a priority in that context of hand washing. Uh, we did see, have a lot of responses, people perhaps willing to use the water, uh, but they would say that they would want to rewash uh, when they go home, um, particularly before cooking or for going for prayer. And lastly, uh, general strong support for general household purposes uh, with this recycled water, um, though there are a number of cultural taboos uh, depending on the location in terms of um, what you might do or how this water might be applied, um, particularly as it relates to things that have a religious orientation or, or directly uh, contribute to or income of the household. So, so that's just a, a very quick snapshot of uh, a lot of data uh, and a lot of findings that we have. Um, and we also have baseline research that we've done uh, uh, over the last couple months in South Africa, um, and we'll continue to do this kind of user research in, in the Durban location uh, once that system gets up and running.
So let me wrap up in just acknowledging, uh, first, obviously, the, the great support of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, for the Reinvent the Toilet Program and our close partnership with Duke uh, Center for Wash Aid. And then a whole host of, of partners uh, that have helped us with research and data collection um, and user insights uh, to prototyping and technology development um, in India and South Africa. So with that, I'll wrap up um, and open the floor for questions.